Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Haynes. Tonight on Greater Boston, the website formerly known as Twitter has had a tumultuous year under Elon Musk. His takeover and all that's happened since is the focus of a new documentary from Frontline. The director joins me ahead. Then a judge has ruled the January shooting death of a Cambridge student, Saeed Fazel, was justified. We'll dig into how the community is responding and how mental health plays into it all. It's been nearly a year since Elon Musk officially took over as the new head of Twitter after bidding $43 billion on the website and then trying and failing to back out of the deal. Since then, the social media platform, now known as X, has been inundated with conflict and controversy, from a spike in hate speech and disinformation to a series of policy changes, including a total overhaul of the verification process. So where does all of this leave the platform once lauded as a tool of revolution and democracy. That's the subject of the new frontline documentary, Elon Musk Twitter Takeover. For the past six months, we've been investigating Elon Musk's controversial purchase of Twitter, how it's expanded his influence into politics at a time of deep division across America. Now we've got someone who's going to take over Twitter who actually believes in the Constitution and free speech. And what it means for one of the world's most important platforms for news and political debate to be under the control of one man. This is a human being that we're giving all of this power to. And there are very few checks on that power right now. This is the story of Elon Musk's latest mission and its far-reaching consequences. Well, the film's director is James Jacoby and joins me now. Hi, James. How are you? I'm well. How are you? So this is such an interesting and timely documentary to come out right now in thinking about the nature, the culture of Twitter before and the culture of X now. Tell me about when you embarked on this journey to put this together. Uh, we embarked on it about six months ago. Um, and... You know, we'd always wanted to do a, a film about Musk and kind of do a deep dive into to who he is and what what his background and his ventures are. Um, and his purchase of Twitter really served as the perfect catalyst for us because it marked a, a change in him um, that is significant for all of us in some ways. He he before basically pre-pandemic, Musk was mostly involved in. Tesla, SpaceX, kind of hardware. Um, and then he had this sort of political evolution through the pandemic um, and the 2020 election, in part in reaction to changes that had been happening to the political conversation in places like Twitter, and then sort of was activated enough to actually buy the platform. And so it was a really good reason for us to do a deep dive, not just into Musk, but also to the ways in which Twitter had been changing and the ways he was reacting to it and what ultimately led him to buy it. In pulling together the folks you interviewed, and I know that there were dozens of folks, probably more that you engaged in this, were you looking for a, a certain type of person, like, you know, someone who had been at Twitter before and after, someone who had left because of Musk? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so you know, one one thing that was really important to us was to understand the changes at Twitter that Musk was really responding to. He had been an avid tweeter for many, many years. He joined Twitter in 2010, 2011 or so. And, you know, has we have a spreadsheet of thousands and thousands of tweets that he's tweeted um, since then. And um, what was interesting was to kind of understand what it was that he found so problematic about the changes that Twitter had been making. So we wanted to understand, for instance, Twitter had been ramping up its content moderation policies during the pandemic, during the 2020 election, policies around misinformation and disinformation, whether it be about vaccines or about voting. And this rubbed him the wrong way, this sort of kind of putting the fingers on the scale and coming up with more rules in this kind of playground of Twitter. And for someone like Musk, he thought it was limiting of free speech. And he thought that there were pretty dire consequences to that um, in terms of the larger problems with that he saw with free speech in America. And so that's really what motivated him to do it. So we did seek out former employees that were not just writing, but also implementing these policies at Twitter to try to understand where they were coming from and what, you know, their reaction to Musk's reaction was.
It seems like there are, in addition, obviously, to Elon Musk as a, a central character here, there were many, it seemed like there were other so-called characters, like, for instance, the misinformation that was happening on the Internet writ large, you know, the conspiracy theorists that, that influenced Musk or, or potentially influenced Musk. You also had yes. Donald Trump as a major character here. Yeah. Yes, we, we do. I mean, that's the thing is that while this is a portrait of Musk, it's also kind of a portrait of where we've come from over the past few years politically. Um, Musk has affiliated, interestingly, with sort of a far right portion of America over the past few years. This wasn't his, you know, he's never been um, you know, never been a self-described conservative. He's really kind of was difficult for most of his career in life to pin down politically. But basically post-pandemic, and we trace this closely in the film, um, he has basically flirted with, with a lot of conspiratorial ideas and not just flirted with them in some cases, actually posted them and, and, and promoted them and spread them. And um, so we, we do trace that and it does speak to kind of a larger political strain in our con country that we all know about, which is the, the this sort of post-truth era. Mm -hmm. And so when he now is in control of one of the main information platforms and platforms poli for political debate in this country, that's that's the sort of evidence we wanted to put forth to everybody to understand where he's kind of coming from and how he's using the platform, both as a user and as an owner. As folks watch this film, do you think that they'll get They'll, they'll see that the Musk we see in news headlines is the same Musk that you see in the CEO chair of Twitter or the former CEO chair of Twitter and, and beyond. Um, you know, what's interesting is a, a number of the people that did go through the transition at Twitter after he bought it, you know, we, we talked to former employees there that felt optimistic about Musk coming in and buying Twitter. It wasn't as if there was unanimous um, disagreement with his ideas or his practices. They thought maybe the guy on Twitter, the sort of public persona, may be different than somebody in reality. And what we heard over and over again is that it actually wasn't all that different, which I found rather surprising because, you know, here's a person who has been extraordinarily successful and deserves a tremendous amount of credit for his accomplishments in electric vehicles, in space um, technology and satellite technology. So he clearly is a, a very serious person and has clearly managed incredible endeavors very well. Um, but this has been different. And that was fascinating to me to kind of tell, tell this as a chapter of his story as like his, his foray into media is very, very different than his successes in technology and you know hard technology and 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 hardware like rockets and cars yeah we have a, a sound bite um from one of the employees describing how they were were fired and they were surprised as well so let's take a listen to that i was having dinner with my family and i'm on the east coast um, and my phone was just dinging uh, during the dinner i opened my computer and when i had logged in I lost access, like everything shut off. The screen went gray at that moment. And I literally started crying in front of my kids. It could have been handled a whole lot better, should have been handled a whole lot better and with more humanity. Going forward, um, I wanna ask you, James, you know, going forward, do you see now that Twitter has a new sort of person in the leadership helm and things like that, um, do you see the sort of I guess, wildness of the beginning of Elon Musk's takeover sort of ebbing into a more, uh, I guess, calmer culture, or, or is this just the beginning? It's a great question, and I, I wish I could I could tell you the future. I, I think that, um, you know, I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt that this is a, this was, he's he's got a steep learning curve here. You know, this isn't 
rockets. This isn't vehicles. This is social media, which in and of itself is a hornet's nest when it comes to problems. And um, and that running a company like this is very difficult and making money as a company like this is very difficult. So I think it remains to be seen. I think that one of the things that is significant and that we do know is that we're having to take his word and Linda Yaccarino, his new CEO, her word for the their claims that, for instance, hate speech is down on the platform, or their claims that their that that their counterclaims to the idea that disinformation or misinformation is up on the platform. So, we the Twitter used to be a very transparent company, and it is no longer transparent about with data, actual data about what's going on on its platform. Mm. And I think that that's where the devil in the details is, right? And so. If he were to open up the company to more scrutiny and to more data and be more transparent, we'd have a better ability to judge what's really going on. Um, but yeah, I, I think he wants this to succeed and he's going to iterate and he's going to experiment and we'll see where he ends up. All right, that's for sure. James Jacoby and the film is Elon Musk's Twitter takeover. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And you can catch part one of Elon Musk's Twitter takeover tonight at 9 o'clock and part two tomorrow at 9 right here on GBH2 and online at GBH.org slash frontline. A Cambridge police officer was justified in shooting and killing 20-year-old UMass Boston student Saeed Fazel earlier this year. That's the decision from a local judge who was asked by the Middlesex County District Attorney to independently review the shooting. Faisal was killed on January 4th after police responded to a 911 call that he had jumped out of an apartment and was cutting himself with a knife. According to the judge's report, Faisal first ran away from police, but later, after he was hit by one officer with a less than lethal round, then began walking towards another officer with his knife pointed out. That's when, according to this report, the second officer shot Faisal. The judge, who interviewed dozens of witnesses for his investigation, wrote, quote, a reasonable law enforcement officer in the same position would reasonably believe that he, along with his fellow officers and others, were in imminent danger of being seriously injured or killed. But... The investigation and the decision has done little to appease community outrage or concerns about how police respond to people in the middle of a mental health crisis. Well, joining me now to discuss all of this is Ken Reeves, former Cambridge mayor who now heads the Cambridge NAACP, and Dr. Greg Block, the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Health, Law, Policy, and Ethics at Georgetown University and co-director of the Georgetown Johns Hopkins Joint Program of Law and Public Health health. Good evening to you both. Good evening. Great to be with you. Uh, so Ken, I want to start here in Cambridge. And how is the community, I guess, feeling after this judge's, uh, you know, decision or uh, to this inquest? Well, first, I want to uh, just say to the family of Saeed Faisal that uh, we're with them, and we do continue to feel their pain. The, the most beautiful thing about Cambridge in the 21st century is that we still do feel each and every death. Mm -hmm. So his loss has been a major uh, issue in Cambridge. And the fact that this death was followed with so little transparency. I mean, this happened in January. We're getting the report in October. Uh, the judge interviewed up to 30 witnesses. Nobody from the public was there. So exactly how do we evaluate the judge's conclusion based on the zero information we have, this other from him? So the Canterbridgeans are not happy. And we, as we call ourselves the people Republic, uh, we really do expect more transparency. This information of who the shooter was should have been public long ago. There are no secrets in Cambridge. We all know who the shooter was. Right, because so, this is when the first time we under, we had the officer's name Yes, but it, 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 it didn't yeah. serve the officer, and, and the, our purpose is not to demonize that person, but it would seem that this family would, in, in, in nine months, should know who mm -hmm. 
uh, it, it's just quite incongruous. And, and a lot of this is wrongful, and there's also no winners in this. Nobody right. won right. in this instance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Block, I, I, we were talking a little bit off camera about this tension between police and the communities and also dealing with individuals who may or may not be suffering from mental health and then having a situation like this. And we should note that, you know, Mr. Faisal didn't necessarily have a mental health diagnosis at the time of this incident, but we know that it's a problem in many other incidents. This is a, a, a gut-wrenching tragedy. Mm. Uh, and my heart goes out to the uh, family that suffered this uh, terrible loss uh, that probably could have been avoided. Mm. Uh, there's a larger context here, and that is that across this country, there are hundreds of thousands of police officers out on the street, most of whom are trying to do their job the right way, but who don't have basic training in how to deal with folks who are struggling with mental illness, who are struggling with substance abuse, and who are disturbed in ways that uh, present uh, behavior that's troublesome and uh, even scary. Um, and the problem is made worse by the reality that police culture is oftentimes a kind of macho culture, a kind of, as, as a colleague of mine who trains police, uh, puts it a door knocker culture, meaning knocking down doors. That's the cool manly thing to do uh, amongst uh, some police. Um, and the result is that you get behavior on the street that can terrify anybody, certainly terrify folks who are emotionally or cognitively disturbed. Uh, a lot of people who are emotionally or cognitively disturbed have deficiencies of mental processing. And so imagine a group of several cops screaming at you, sometimes, and I've seen videos along these lines, sometimes screaming obscenities, mm. high volume, high pressured speech. Uh, and uh, all of us, almost all of us, I submit, would have trouble processing that, would be terrified. But folks who have diminished biological ability uh, to process uh, commands and requests are going to be even more trouble. Uh, and some will react uh, in ways that reflect their terror and that can in turn be scary to others. And so you have, when you have poor training and you have this kind of behavior by police, this aggressive behavior, as opposed to a more soothing approach. You know, this, uh, yeah, this case, though, is happening. more complicated in this sense. In the People's Republic of Cambridge, we have a very well-resourced uh, police department that believes that it has really turned the page on that old-style policing and mm. that they very much do have training in, in dealing with mental health issues. Mm. And I myself have seen some extraordinary tapes of them facing into people who are just really mentally not there, wow. but aggressive. So mm. the, in this case, uh, we would say he, he, part of the facts here are that the police sergeant instructed one of the officers to, to shoot something like a stun gun, mm -hmm. which did not work. So they, they were trying to do something gradual, but it didn't work at all. And the, the odd facts here are that this, the deceased never said a word at, for the entire time. So they don't know what his state of mind was, etc. And this knife, he was pointing to cut himself mm -hmm. at all times. And if you really read the judge's decision closely, it says that he turned and the knife was in front of him. Now, is in front of him pointing toward the police officer, or is he just holding the knife in front of him? We don't get to know because we don't have the, we weren't there for the witnesses, et cetera. Right. But it, it, we know the happen. distance that this police officer was uh, from, uh, that, the, that the officers were uh, from the individual who was Well, killed. I think there's a dispute about the distance, but what I would like to know- But it, an it, important dispute though. Because, an important dispute mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it has to go to whether or not the officers felt uh, felt they were in danger or were they actually in danger of that of being stabbed and things like that mm -hmm. and that is in dispute that's the facts mm -hmm. that are in dispute mm -hmm. but dr block i would love to know even in the best case scenario right where you have a cambridge police department that have gone through you know modern training or progressive training and things like that 
How do things like this happen? And what needs to be done going forward so that better outcomes happen, especially for folks who may be suffering from either acute mental episode or something that is diagnosable? Well, I'm glad to hear that in Cambridge there is that kind of training Mm -hmm. because that's something that sadly hasn't happened in most American uh, police departments. That's a really important Mm -hmm. step forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the question of training and the question of culture on the street, though, are different. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe there's even the question of culture in the squad car or amongst uh, a group of just several cops who are on the beat together. Um, This all needs to penetrate to the level of culture uh, on the street. Now, another really important piece of this uh, and I don't know enough about the case to know how that play, how it played out in this case. But another really important piece is who gets the call when something is understandable as a mental health crisis. And so it does sound like there were initial signals that this was a matter of self-destructive behavior, uh, not primarily a threat to others. He, and he so hit that jumped sounds through like a reason- window, broken through a window, jumped out the window, and was sitting down cutting himself with glass and this knife when they appeared. Right. No shoes on. Why doesn't that lead to a call to uh, emergency medical services, to mental health trained uh, 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 technicians uh, that are part of EMS, uh, et cetera? Uh, Now, you could imagine a scenario in which a call like this leads to both police and emergency medical services of folks coming out. In some areas, there's been experimentation with especially mental health trained uh, paraprofessionals uh, uh, rather than cops. So bringing um, in more people on the force in these in these spaces probably could have changed the outcome. Be, and be, so in the last minute mm-hmm, here, because mm-hmm, I want to make sorry. sure we get to the to 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 wrap this segment up mm-hmm. in, a, in a way where what would the, what do you think would help make the community whole in the last 40 seconds that we have? I know this is a complicated I, I, I'll answer. I'll try to be brief. I think that the biggest thing that this has led us to, because all of the things you would think, mental health workers, et cetera, the new city manager has said, you know, we're going to beef up and by next year we will have all that in place. This is an in, in issue or area for invention. Mm-hmm. And Cambridge is the most uh, innovative square mile in, in the universe. What happened? We need more means of subduing individuals, which is not with guns. The purpose of the right. police is to serve and protect us. It's not to kill us. So can we not give them more tools to subdue us when we are out of our mind for the moment mm-hmm. that don't lead in our death. And, right. and, and so this is wrongful because of the outcome. Right. And, and there's no way, right. I, whatever the judge wrote, mm-hmm. this is not the, and I bet no one, including the officer, this is not the outcome any of us would, would have wanted. Right. Why did we get it? Right. And, and I'm calling on our scientists at MIT yeah. and Harvard. Really, this, you know, if the gladiators had those, those yeah. nets they could throw over right. people, how come in the 21st century we're limited to stun guns? Or- exactly. And I think you and Dr. Block are saying the exact same thing. We're going to have to leave the conversation mm-hmm. there. Thank you, gentlemen, for so Thank much you. for your time. Thank you very much. Lively discussion, absolutely. And finally tonight, a look at the new Edward Hopper exhibition at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. GBH Executive Arts Editor Jared Bowen has more. The seagulls sail and squawk over Gloucester, a coastal city and historic fishing port on the north shore of Massachusetts. Like the gulls, artists have also long flocked here, including 100 years ago, Edward Hopper. When you think about Edward Hopper and his ultimate goal to paint sunlight on the side of a house, um, he, in this series of homes, found that opportunity. Oliver Barker is the director of the Cape Ann Museum, which just opened its largest ever exhibition, a show that documents house by house, landscape by landscape, how Edward Hopper found himself as a painter. This exhibition is about place, but it is also about an artist's process um, and learning a new medium uh, and seeing the impact of that. Hopper had been to Cape Ann before, but in 1923, he took root, spending the first of five consecutive summers here painting the place. He was single, 40, and had only ever sold one painting, so his career was stagnant at best. 
He was far removed from the fame that would come from burrowing into the American psyche with his scenes of urban loneliness, most pointedly rendered in his painting Nighthawks. He was really struggling to make a living. Elliot Bostwick Davis is the show's curator. She says Hopper was drawn to the sea and drew it himself, starting as a young boy growing up in Nyack, New York. He lived right on the waterfront, so from his second-story bedroom window, he could actually see vessels um, sailing along the Hudson. And We have in the show an early uh, drawing that he made in pencil. And his mother was an artist, which is another interesting aspect of him. It would be another woman, though, who ultimately changed the course of Hopper's career. In the summer of 23, he met Josephine Nivison, an artist with whom he'd crossed paths before. She had a lot to be proud of. Her work was being shown in the Daniel Gallery in New York. She also had her paintings selected for an important traveling exhibition in 1924 winter, which was going to be shown in both Paris and London. In short order, the pair found both artistic and romantic connections. Also an art teacher, she pushed Hopper, moving him out of his comfort zone where he meticulously planned his illustrations and etchings and into watercolors. Watercolor is harder to control. It's essentially pigment suspended in water. Ultimately, it helps him get out of his own way and to let himself be a little more spontaneous and perhaps tap into more of that subconscious. It's, it's maybe for athletes the way you think of that moment of flow. When you're in it, you know it. And she becomes his biggest champion. Do we have an understanding of why she started to step away from her own career and identify him as the person who should move forward? I think she was a pragmatist. She understood that one of them had to succeed, and I think she saw what it took for him to become Edward Hopper. A year later, the pair was married. Together, the Hoppers toured Cape Ann, often capturing the same subjects like Gloucester's landmark church. Edward was especially drawn to fishing scenes, to the immigrant community in the city's Italian neighborhood, and to the signals of modern times, like utility poles. He also dwelled on dwellings, and many of Hopper's homes still stand, like Anderson's house and Hodgkin's house. What do you think it is about this particular house that speaks to that kind of Hopper, is it loneliness, mystery? 1928, he comes back, and the painting in the, in the show is really his first house portrait in oil. There's a, almost a split personality between the light facade, uh, which is much more ornate, and then the stark facade on the front, which is much more somber. And perhaps a metaphor now for the light and dark in Hopper's artistic life. After that first summer in Gloucester, his career began to crack open. He sold his first work in more than a decade, this watercolor of a grand Gloucester home. He had a new artistic eye and fervor, and it, Davis says, transformed him in ways that can be traced through the rest of his career. I love uh, motifs that show up here in Gloucester, like in Tony's house we have the fire hydrant on a mound in watercolor. And of course the most famous fire hydrant I think anyone ever painted in American art is in Early Sunday Morning, where we see it uh, as the sole object on the sidewalk casting that long shadow. Hopper, for some reason, loved intersections. He loves this unusually shaped uh, building at the corner of Portuguese Hill. Of course, corner buildings became the subject of his nocturnal drugstore scene of 1927. And it all happened here at the intersection of Cape Ann, Josephine, and Edward Hopper. The exhibit is on display through October 16th. Head to capeannmuseum.org for more. That's it for tonight, but we'll be back tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Crystal Haynes. Good night.